Hey there, everyone, and welcome to Twin Movies. I'm Ben Phelps, and I'm joined by my banter buddy in crime, Gabe Dowrick. Hello. So, every year, Hollywood releases two movies based on the same idea. Which movie did it better? How did this happen? And what would make a better third movie? Today, we'll be reviewing two classic twin movies about superheroes fighting superheroes. That's Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, and Captain America, Civil War. So, Gabe, let's kick off this episode with an overview of these twin movies, which are both about these iconic good superheroes going head-to-head against each other. On the 25th of March, 2016, Batman v Superman was released. Here's the IMDb synopsis. Fearing that the actions of Superman are left unchecked, Batman takes on the Man of Steel, while the world wrestles with what kind of hero it really needs. Shortly afterwards, on 6th of May, 2016, Captain America Civil War was released. Here's the IMDb synopsis. Political involvement in the Avengers affairs caused the rift between Captain America and Iron Man. So, Gabe, let's start with what these films mean to us, if anything, which we'll get to. Did you <laughs> <laughs> did you first see Batman v Superman? I'm not going to use the entire unworldly title, which we'll get to. Is every problem. time. I want it every time. <laughs> did you first see Batman v Superman when it was released at the cinema? And if so, what was that experience like? I didn't. I think I first saw it while drunk, like really drunk, just watching it at home. But I don't really remember. You know, it's interesting, these ones, because I think these are both films that came out in 2016. Your memory of sort of seeing it is certainly not tinged with that kind of nostalgic haze that something like, talk about something like The Matrix is. So, sadly, on this one, not much of a story. B versus S, drunk. What about you? <laughs> I saw it at the cinema. So I saw originally the theatrical version, which I think is about two and a half hours long. And later on on DVD or Blu-ray, I saw the Ultimate Edition, which is three hours long, which has half an hour of extra footage. And if you read the reviews online, which we'll get to, that half an hour, people say, makes it better if you already like the film, but doesn't fix the film if you don't really like it. So my experience- I've only seen the regular cut. The regular version. Okay, we'll get to that then. The theatrical. Okay. Yeah. So look, my experience was- Great excitement. I mean, I always found the concept a bit goofy because these are both iconic, good superheroes in my background. I, for the context, I've never been a Marvel or DC comic reader. In fact, I never read any comic books or graphic novels as a kid. Maybe that was a combination of the small city I lived in, my family's background. Comics weren't really part of the scene of graphic novels when I was a kid in my particular circles. So I didn't bring anything to these Batman adaptations from Tim Burton's 89 classic onwards, other than having watched that classic um, Burt Ward and what's his name? Six Adam years West. Don't you love how I actually remembered Burt Ward's name? Burt Ward? Is it Burt Ward? I don't even know yeah, if I that's think so. right. I'm 95% really? right, going on 5% wrong, that Robin's real life name, the actor, is Burt Ward. But why would you bring up Robin first anyway? That's I know. weird. Like who remembers Robin? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Apparently, at the end of The Dark Knight Rises, Christopher Nolan does. Sure. (laughs) So, great. I didn't bring anything to this particular film other than having loved The Dark Knight and, to a lesser degree, The Dark Knight Rises, Christopher Nolan's adaptations. So, I hadn't watched or read anything like the Frank Miller comic that supposedly inspired it. To me, I just went in having loved these Christopher Nolan films, went in, saw the film, and then was pretty disappointed afterwards and then jumped onto the internet and read all the blogs and reviews. And this film- Hold up. Did you go into this thinking it was a sequel to the- No, no. That was just sort of my pedigree of history. I wasn't going in as a huge fan of Frank Miller's comic at all, where they were suddenly bringing this classic story to life that I'd read years ago as a kid. I just knew that it was based on or inspired by the premise of Frank Miller's Batman Returns or something like that. And that's all. So other than that, I really only had The Dark Knight and The Dark Knight Rises and Batman Begins as reference pinnacle points before this film. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that both you and I are sort of comic book and comic genre agnostic in a way in such that we're not, I believe, the sort of term people like to throw around in a sort of derogatory sense, whatever yeah, fan that's right. Is. We're certainly not throwing around hashtag release the Snyder Cuts at every opportunity yeah. online or standing Marvel movies like they're the greatest cultural achievement exactly. of our I think it's era. fair to say that because Marvel and DC superhero films just dominate the box office, for a start, it limits the number of films you can see in terms of the variety. So I think you and I are similar in that we appreciate 
good versions of the superhero genre, but we're not just sort of going to watch every single one for the sake of it. We'll watch the good versions of those and appreciate them for what they are, but we're not slaves to the genre. But you've seen every Marvel movie. I know. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. So a couple months later, after Batman v Superman came out, Captain America Civil War was released. So, Gabe, talk me through when and how you watched Civil War. This one I definitely saw at the movies, although I have to admit, I don't really remember much about it. I remember enjoying the movie well enough, but certainly there's nothing about the the theatre going experience or the, the sort of the hype around it or anything. I think it was just one of those went and saw it on a Sunday afternoon and yep, that was a ticked it off the list. Probably went home and played some PlayStation. I don't know. Nothing real exciting there, I'm afraid, with this choice. Yeah, anecdote. I recall seeing the cinema as well. I just saw it, I guess, because I really enjoyed Captain America Winter Soldier. That film kind of tapped into my love for the supposed references that created that film, such as those sort of seventies conspiracy thrillers. So oh, God, talk, I the marketing that. spin. A, that just yeah. seemed like such a oh, yeah, it's just like a publicist banged in, you know, that into a press kit and everyone just started saying, oh, it's the parallax view of superhero movies. Well, apparently referencing Three Days of the Condor was enough to get our good old mate on board for Winter Soldier as well. So Bobby Redford. Yeah. Yeah, but like just having him in your movie is not enough to suddenly be like, ooh, it's a 70s paranoia. Like, I don't remember any 70s paranoia thrillers with a fight atop a giant floating aircraft carrier. Totally. But I Maybe enjoyed I that film, so the goodwill from that film encouraged me to see this one, which is basically really Avengers 2.5. This was the Avengers uh, bookmark between Age of Ultron and then Infinity War. Yeah, it certainly crams them all in. So let's uh, jump into, before we jump to a review, let's do a quick comparison of these movies and find out how we got here with a shallow dive into the Hollywood history behind these two flicks. So really quickly summarise, both of these films are based on graphic novels slash comics of the same name. In fact, I've been using the word graphic novels, but I'm going to use the word comics because we've been so cultured to use the word graphic novel referring to certain illustrated books as a sense because they're thematically deeper or because they're a invention of the art form. But these are comics. These are comics. So both these stories are based on comics that had this storyline. Obviously, in the adaptation, they've changed slightly, but the basic premise of Good superhero against good superhero is based on classic stories. Now, we know that Marvel has had a lot of these films placed out for a long time in advance, from Iron Man in 2008 right through to the recent Avengers Endgame, and this was just one of those planks in that story to lead into Infinity War. With Batman v Superman, that film was basically a pseudo-sequel to Man of Steel, but the fact that Batman features first in the title says a lot, and from all reports... Zack Snyder is much more interested in the character of Batman and Superman, which we'll get to. So this is really a Batman film first, not a Superman sequel. And it was in development for a few years. They brought on to much chagrin amongst the, quote, fanboy community, Ben Affleck as Batman, which is very controversial at the time. But everyone was a huge fan of Henry Cavill, who played Superman, so that wasn't such a bad deal. Gal Gadot was a controversial choice as well at the time, as were these early pictures showing these very desaturated palettes, you know, in terms of desaturating the color scheme of their costumes. And then, bang, unfortunately, through a longer post production process, Batman v Superman gets drawn out. And so suddenly they're released in the same year, about eight weeks apart. So let's jump into a review of the first film. Batman v Superman. Gabe, did you like it? I kind of did. <laughs> I don't know. Like, this is one of those movies, I guess, that they just get the hell of a lot of shit, doesn't it? Like, people just like to bag it online. And a lot of that, I guess, to do is kind of the memification of movies, you know, like the the Martha thing. Like, yeah. oh, Martha, we got the bit. I don't know. I, I feel myself quite enjoying it. I think it's got a bit of a rough first kind of 20 or 30 minutes. But then, I don't know, it's quite nicely made. It's got a Zack Snyder, he knows how to kind of put together a, a scene. It's nicely photographed. I'm not an adherent to the comic. So, Frank, I don't really care if Batman goes around murdering the shit out of a whole bunch of people. So, I guess things like that don't really irk me as much as they might piss off someone who thinks that that's some sort of betrayal. But when I rewatched it, not drunk, I've got to admit I had a reasonably good time with this. Yeah, look, it's funny, isn't it? This film has been bagged to shit. It really received an absolute lashing from the critics. The film has one of the records, I think, the worst drop for a large-scale film. 
between the box office at the start and the end, which we'll come back to. So between bad word of mouth and bad critical reviews, this film wasn't received well. And it's funny too because I agree with you. I actually don't mind it. In fact, there's a lot I actually like about it. I agree with you. It's very beautifully constructed. I mean, Zack Snyder is a visualist and he does an incredible job creating these tableaus just spectacular images. He obviously enjoys his slow motion, his ramped up shots. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but the star of this film, I mean, it's absolutely exquisite. And apparently when they made this film and did the first screenings for executives at Warner Brothers, everyone just 100% was all in thinking this was going to be an absolute global smash of Avatar and Endgame proportions. It was Batman and Superman together. It looked incredible. Everyone was on board and no one anticipated the critical and fanboy backlash this film ultimately received. But when you watch the film, I mean, in many respects, I think for the first two thirds anyway, it's quite an enjoyable film. For me, I like the visuals. I think Zack Snyder definitely has a problem in that I think he does lots of great moments and there's a lot of critical commentary through, you know, with video essays and a really popular online critic. I know you're not a huge fan necessarily, but the movie Bob, Bob Chipman, he has a three-part video essay series that I think is about four hours long. It's actually longer than the ultimate edition. Like four hours. Look, mate, edit it down. <laughs> Give it to me in 40 minutes. Like, Jesus. It's actually really good though. It goes through why this film doesn't work and it actually loaded me to many of the flaws, which I wasn't aware of. Is it like structural things, like construction of the overall plot, like why one scene follows another? Um, and character hypocrisies and inconsistencies. Yeah, yeah, sure. I can see how that is messy. And yeah. Some of that overall construction could be kind of better and so on. But it's funny, when you were talking before about the, the execs, it feels to me like if you watch dailies from this, you'd be like, this shit is going to be amazing. Like, look at this shot of Superman, surra- like, in front of the sun or surrounded by people trying to touch him. Or I think you're spot on when you say there's all these just individual moments that in of themselves are really cool, but maybe if you add them all up, it just doesn't quite become a cohesive whole or something. To me, the biggest flaw of this film, actually there's a quite a few, but let's start with conceptually it's always a hard sell to get anyone on board who's not in the comic base to the idea that these two good superheroes go head to head. So you're already working against that expectation. Everyone loves Superman, loves Batman. Batman in the 90s, noughties and 2010s is much more popular as a character than the Boy Scout, the Superman's hero. But those two characters are both historically in mainstream society recognised as good characters. So you've got to have a really good setup to try and get these guys to go head to head against each other in a way where the stakes are high enough that they actually might kill each other but actually, in the end, don't do so. And this film has the most ridiculous plot. I don't know where to start, and Bob Chipman does a better job of this than me describing how ludicrous it is. But the idea that this Mark Zuckerberg slash Joker by Heath Ledger from The Dark Knight Rises character played by Jesse Eisenberg apparently does all of these things in a very complicated way to try and pit these two characters against each other. And it's ludicrous. Like, there are so many issues. There's Let's say there's 50 plot problems with that. One of the classic ones I love is the idea that Lex Luthor plants a bullet to stage a massacre somewhere, I think it's meant to be like Kenya or Nairobi in opening scene. Yeah, East Africa. Yeah, or right, with the idea of placing Superman at the scene because these bullets are somehow connected to him, which is just bizarre. I didn't understand any of that. And if someone asked me to explain that whole plot back to them, I'd have no shot. Although i got to say, I did quite like the idea that, and maybe this is a thing, maybe they should have just kept it simpler. Because in a sort of response to the criticisms of Man of Steel, Superman recklessly destroys cities. This opens with Batman driving through the city while Superman's fighting Zod. And he's like, business manager? I don't know, some bloke in wayne tower or something gets killed and he looks around and sees the destruction which superman has wrought and is therefore straight away kind of antagonistic towards him what i don't get is couldn't you just use that as the launching pad like why do you need all this other shit well you're totally right like that film man of steel was really criticized for the collateral damage where 
Man of Steel, Superman didn't actually fight in a more deserted location or wasn't more sensitive to all of the innocent people around him. And to take that criticism and totally use it as the opening scene, as the catalyst and the motivation for Bruce Wayne's character, I think is so smart because yeah, I like you're that. addressing fan criticism and then saying, oh, no, but you don't realise that's how he goes up against Superman. In some ways, actually, I think kind of almost is a slap over the wrist to the critics of the first film because then if you watch the two films in conjunction, which is always an unreasonable expectation to have, but at least I think it forgives some of the sins of the first film, Man of Steel, then you're right. That's, I think, almost enough. And there's a line Batman uses, which is basically something along the lines of, if there's only 5% chance that this guy could destroy the world, we can't take that chance. We must take him out. It might even be less chance than that. It's like a 1% yeah, chance. Yeah, that's right. And that logic you can kind of get on board with, given the absolute carnage we've seen in the previous film and the opening scene of Batman v Superman. Though Batman should probably kill himself too because he's a reckless rich guy. I mean, he's got just as much shot as destroying the world as Superman, frankly. Yeah, you're right. And actually, if you think about the way he's sort of like defined with Jesus' iconography, then the idea of him being a martyr perhaps and flying away from Earth and leaving it behind or sacrificing himself in some ways would at least be in character with the way Zack Snyder has characterised him in the film. But, I mean, it is ludicrous. This whole plot with Lex Luthor setting all these chess pieces in place, which so unlikely to each occur but miraculously do, makes no sense at all. But up for the first two thirds of this film, I'm totally on board. Like, I like Batman in his sort of lake house. I like Jeremy Irons' character. I like the visuals of him, like, as a bat almost in the corner of a, a ceiling, an opening scene where these prisoners, these either sex slaves or illegal immigrants are scared of him like he's a devil or a demon. I mean, it's a pretty violent, horrific movie, I guess, for, you know, there's that, he has that dream at one point where he is like a man bat. Oh, that's right. Not the futuristic bit with the monsters flying around with Superman laser eyes everyone, but like there's a bit where he like wakes up from a, and you're right, like the branding yeah, of people. Yeah. Oh, pretty, it's intense. Pretty dark stuff. And so I guess for the first two thirds, I'm really on board the film in any respects. I'm kind of forgiving all the ridiculous Lex Luthor things, but I'm on board with Gal Gadot's character, who I was really critical of myself being cast. I thought she was just too wafy and slight and didn't have enough presence, but actually does a pretty good job and does an increasingly better job in her own standalone film. So for the first sort of two thirds, I'm, I'm totally on board until they get to the last third, which is that crazy hybrid type Zod character that's been blended with the DNA of one of Peter Jackson's monsters from Lord of the Rings. Oh, it's and terrible. It's just nonsense. It looks like a cave from yeah, Bernie. It's, it's just nonsense. Awful. And like it, the fight's got a few kind of great moments where they take turns between Wonder Woman's lasso. No, I just tuned out all of that It just shit. feels like nonsense. And I think it's also really hard to, when you have characters that fly, it is very hard to have good fight choreography because, like we discussed with The Matrix, you can just escape. But it's really emblematic of the, so many of these movies, I guess, have just these indestructible CGI battles at the end. I'm sure it's a common complaint that I've heard lots of people make, but I glaze over. Like the last 30 minutes of this film, or it feels interminable, all of that, trying to get a spear to jam in this frog face thingy. That they knew. Oh, that's right. And also, like, it's it's also silly because it's shot so uh, in such low light with this sort of, I guess, sort of like fire to sort of signify like we're on a hellscape of some sort. I just find it doesn't reach the beauty or the choreography of the rest of the film, and just feels like a typical bombastic third act. I'm not sure if they had that magic blue light coming out of the sky, which defines every Marvel movie at the end, but. It seems to have everything else, in fact, and I just tuned out. Yeah, they don't close the portal. They might close the portal in Justice League. I can't really remember. <laughs> but nonetheless, in this one, there's no so, portal. I guess then comparing that to Captain America Civil War, it's the same thing. Did you like it? What worked for you about that film and what didn't work for you? I like this one fine. I like the idea that they're sort of pitting two characters that you like against each other. And I think they do a better, you know, they have the benefit of more movies behind them, the Marvel films. You're a bit more, I suppose, invested in who's right and who's wrong. And I think the arguments in Captain America are a little more interesting and nuanced about should they sign the, what are they called? The Accords. Sokovia Accords. And I like the way they just jammed Spider-Man in this and got an entire character's backstory out and like origin film in another movie, yeah. like two scenes. Yeah, so it's so that was really good. Just because I just don't want to have to sit through another one of those fucking origin films. So very nicely done. But yeah, I thought this was pretty good. 
But I just don't remember a huge amount of, about it. Like a lot of these movies, I guess, all superhero movies, I don't mean particularly Marvel movies, they just sort of wash over me. Yeah, I mean, I'd say with both these films, you know? they're type of films which basically, sorry, I'd say with the Captain America film and a lot of Marvel films, they just sand the corners off. And so the films don't have much edge yeah. to them. They don't feel as I- totally. iconic or there's nothing dangerous about them at all. I mean, this is the thing about Batman v Superman. I think it swings and it misses, but at least it swings. Oh, it's a big swings. Yeah, totally. It's a big miss. We've talked before about how you and I appreciate a film that just swings to the fences and it doesn't connect. Well, at least they went for it. But it's those films that I think that are often divisive that at least are memorable and they resonate and they have a point of discussion and you might argue about whether it was good or bad afterwards, but at least it tried to say something. Captain America, I came into that as a huge fan of The Winter Soldier and that film benefited from eight years of development beforehand where they had eight years to establish almost every character except Black Panther and Spider-Man. And look, it's fine. I mean, it's not one of the strongest Marvel films for me. If we sort of started with Batman v Superman, I think this film is pretty bland looking. It looks pretty muted. The big showdown is in a almost like as a reaction to the, the Superman Man of Steel thing. The big showdown between all of these superheroes is in a kind of parking lot. Yeah, totally. You're absolutely right. It does feel like this film did the same thing as Batman v Superman and reacted to the risk of fanboys being concerned about collateral damage and has it at this airport. I guess the implication is that there are big airplane, airplanes around and that's not as a big deal, but it is and the most empty airport you'll ever see. There's no sign of any sirens or people appearing. It's kind of pretty bizarre that not a single other person in any capacity appears. No helicopters, none of those crazy guys waving their sticks in the air trying to call the fight off. But <laughs> sure, there's actually a YouTube video by the, a YouTuber and video essayist, Patrick H. Willems, on YouTube. And one of the YouTube videos that kind of kicked off and made his YouTube channel pretty big was actually criticizing the look, the aesthetic, the color correction of these Marvel films in that they're not often color graded in a way that's interesting. They're quite muted looking, uh, really low contrast. And often, you know, they occasionally take some of those, what they'd call a splash page form of composition from the comics, but they don't feel shot like any way that's sort of distinctive at all. You don't kind of feel the hand of the filmmaker guiding the visual style and as flawed. Yeah, if someone said to me, oh, name a DOP that shot a Marvel movie. I mean, you could name the DOP, but I mean, you would imagine they have a pretty hefty look, uh, like style guide that they hand out for these things. 100%. Like, for example, I think Larry Fong is the DOP for Zack Snyder's, isn't he, most of the time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I actually know that because I was impressed by the look of the film and looked it up on IMDb. I've never gone to IMDb and chased the DOP's name from any of the Marvel films. Like, I never see a male film and go, oh, wow, like the style of that makes me want to know who was behind the camera. And what? so what had he done beforehand? Shot Captain America, District 9, Elysium, okay. Chappie, and then he did Avengers afterwards. But quite an indistinct look. That's Surely that's got to be a decision by Marvel so that all of their films all very clearly exist within a shared palette, right? Yeah, that's right, I think. But I think what's interesting is that if you look at – the course correction by Warner Brothers with their DC films, like most recently Aquaman, there is a way of actually having your own look to a film and maybe you just don't try and force it into the family. I guess that's what DC is learning to do, which is to go for individual types of films that work on their own merits rather than trying to force this shared universe. But I guess the positive is that in having this giant filmic-esque TV series they've had for the last 11 years. You can understand why Marvel has gone for the same aesthetic, from the same style guide, as you say, because it just means that from film to film, you go with the journey. Does this one have much humour? I can't really remember. It does. Ant-Man and Spider-Man, they do some gags. Yeah, totally. That's it. I mean, it's pretty serious between Tony and Captain America, Tony Stark and Captain America. But yeah, it's mainly the light relief is Ant-Man and Spider-Man. Yeah, I mean, look, those films are good at quips and I guess that's where the Marvel films have defined themselves differently to the DC universe in that 
it's a lighter film set in our world with cities that we recognise and DC has gone for the dark, grittier look. And that expression. Would it kill Batman to smile more? You can see his mouth. He's got a cowl specifically designed so you can see his mouth, but he never smiles. Never smiles. The only thing you can see are his lips and never smiles. <laughs> and his weirdly large chin that I recall him having. Really just yeah, totally. creates this protruding chin. Anyway. So let's do a bit of a combined review here. So notable similarities, like any coincidences or ripoffs. Well, this is interesting because I never thought of these two movies as being twin movies until you said, what about these two movies? So I sort of hadn't put that together whatsoever. Are they much more similar than I thought? I mean, the basic premise is two good superheroes going head to head. That's the obvious one. Both films feature ridiculous plans by villains, which make no sense. Like, again, going to YouTube video essayists, you'll find like these descriptions where they describe the plan and it goes on about 12 cocktail napkins. It's so elaborate. Yeah, Baron Zemo relies on being caught like every other yes. super villain in the sort of 2000s. All exactly. That sort of stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Both films, I guess, there are small details like in Batman v Superman, they reference metahumans and in Civil War they refer to enhanced humans and in both stories there's this concern about whether superheroes should be regulated. They're both sort of about collateral damage as well, I guess. Yeah, totally. Like, I mean, Bruce Wayne shares the same ideology, I'd say, as Tony Stark in that is if we can't control something, it shouldn't exist. So we can't risk people abusing their superpower, so therefore we have to mitigate the number of superheroes out there in the world. So in Civil War, Tony Stark's in favour of everyone signing on to the Sokovia Accords to try and, I guess, have more accountability placed on the superheroes. And I guess in Batman v Superman, Bruce Wayne is more judge, jury, and executioner in relation to the same idea. Screw those accords. He'll take care of business himself. Yeah, Sokovia Accords. Uh, I guess you'd even look at the marketing. I mean, the marketing of these films, you know, you've got identical posters with two characters facing off against each other, sort of side on profiles, one against the other, really amplifying that idea of these two good guys going head to head. But what else are they going to Are they going to go back to back? Back to back just means yeah. buddies. Or romantic comedy. That. Oh, nice. But there is actually one similarity we haven't discussed, and it is the most important similarity between these films. The Australian actor with the iconic scar on his chin, Callan Mulvey. But he's not in Civil War. Isn't he in Winter Soldier? Doesn't he appear briefly? No, he does. No, he does. No, he does. Look. No, or maybe he doesn't. I thought he was in Winter Soldier in the lift. I came to this podcast just thinking, going to drop Drazic from Heartbreak High as a reference because Australian done good. He's in both. And then I realised it's actually Winter Soldier. And though he also appears in Avengers okay. Endgame. We need to do a offline little check on IMDb after this to see. In fact, you know what? We'll do it now. I'll do it now while you keep talking. Any other similarities at all between these two films? In Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, they set up the next lot. I don't know, man. This was Them being similarities was your thing, dude. Why don't you suddenly put it on me to have written the, <laughs> the essay about this? Fuck. I was here I to learn. I can't be to learn. You are correct. Is that Callum Mulvey does not appear in Civil War. He appears in The Winter Soldier and he also appears in Endgame. So, correction there. He plays like Goon in Lift. Yes. Is this correct? Well, Hydra Goon. Spoilers. Like lead Goon. He plays a Hydra, Hydra trader, but he's working for S.H.I.E.L.D. A High Dragoon. Sure. I guess that'd be the main similarities for me. How about any uh, missed opportunities? Like what could the filmmakers have done better with the high concept of superhero versus superhero? At what point are we going to talk about Jesse Eisenberg as Lex Luthor? Is- oh, okay. Let, let's do that right that? now. Yep. Can we talk about that now? I oh, you like it? <laughs> it's the best. Oh, I love it. I love it so much. It is so good. It is one of the most just ridiculous performances I've ever seen. An absolute misfire that is so great. What, as a choice, we talked recently about Dark City and the choices actors make, for better or worse. And Kiefer Sutherland is playing totally. what appears to be a 55 year old man in Dark City and really going for it with the stutter and the stammer and these odd affectations. Totally. A lot of affectations. So Jesse here, he dials it to 11. It's just every, just repeating words, pointing, fidgeting, like no one ever said, maybe just try a take, but at yeah, 50% totally. of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, apparently yeah. he based a lot of the character on Heath Ledger in The Dark Knight Rises, sorry, The Dark Knight. But here's the problem with this character played by Jesse Eisenberg, Lex Luthor, is that 
as I understand from previous adaptations of this character on screen and from what I know, just sort of peripherally, not being a, a comic fanboy, Lex Luthor is meant to be one of the most intelligent people on the planet, as well as being a wealthy industrialist. So he's basically a bit like Tony Stark. He's a genius and he's very rich. And in this film, they've gone for the rich bit and sort of based him, I guess, on a Silicon Valley type character, you know, and totally trade off what we know about the Mark Zuckerberg characterization played by Jesse Eisenberg from the social network. But he acts like the Joker. He doesn't act particularly smart. I mean, we're told he is smart. We're told that he's a genius. But I actually don't see on screen any demonstration of that intelligence. No, but nonetheless, whenever he pops up on screen, it's like, what is this Wally going to do next? Like, how is he going to chew the scenery in some ridiculous way? And I just found that really entertaining. You know, because it's a movie with a plot that's hard to follow and they're trying to jam in all these other things like the flash appearing from hyperspace, yeah, to the future to warn him about a thing that will never actually happen because they changed the course of the movies and stuff. But it's just, whenever Jesse turns up doing his weird little things, some of which has got to be sort of like he's sort of improvising dialogue on top of what's written by repeating stuff and poking and I loved it. I thought it was great. See, I actually like the idea of Lex Luthor's character in a 2016 adaptation being a Silicon Valley tycoon. I like the fact that he could be someone who demonstrates some of the key characteristics of these contemporary billionaires like Mark Zuckerberg or Larry Page from Google or something like that. If you can find interesting enough characteristics of those characters, because sometimes they're criticized for being (laughs) boring. Mark Zuckerberg has no... Yeah. He has no characteristics. And maybe that's the problem. So I like the idea Excuse of the me. character being of that world. And I think you actually have to try and amplify the character traits to make him more interesting than the real life references, because the real life people, I think, just aren't interesting enough on screen to compete with our superheroes. But then what he's doing, I mean, it is an 11. And, you know, I like the idea that he's wearing sneakers. And I like the idea he's wearing these kind of cash suits and he's got long hair and he's younger. I like all of that, but the Riddler meets Joker characterization that he's going for just seems kind of odd. I mean, the Joker is defined as someone who's an anarchist, and Lex Luthor should be the opposite of that. The Riddler is someone who sort of speaks in riddles and puns, and I guess there's a lot of kind of verbose monologuing by this character in this film, which is kind of Riddler-esque. I thought his plot was dumb and therefore didn't characterize him as being smart. I thought the mannerisms by Eisenberg were over the top. I agree that I can with you that there's something admirable that he's going for something. I just don't think this is the right thing, but at least he went for something. And I think his character, I'd say, is more memorable, for better or worse, than the uh, German antagonist in Civil War. What's his name? Zemo? Yeah. I thought it was Baron Zemo. Is he ever referred to as Baron Zemo? I don't know. Zemo. Zemo. Although Daniel Brühl, man, he's a great actor. Too. Yeah, I mean, that's a good example where I think Daniel Brühl is much more nuanced. And does a pretty- Maybe he's too understated in a way. I, I think <laughs> like, he is. He's actually dialed too far Yeah, I back. think so as well. I mean, I would prefer more understated than less. Sorry, I prefer less than more. But I did think that, uh, yeah, he could have been- I don't know, a little bit more unique on the screen. Like an eye patch. And leather gloves and a cane. He's got Baron Zemo. Like, you got a name. You got a maybe a Yeah, well, IMDb just says Zemo. There's no Baron mentioned at all. Okay. So, which film has aged better? You mean in the three years since they came out? Actually, that's dog probably- years in like superhero terms. Superman vs. Batman, Justice of Dawn, has probably aged kind of badly in that. They changed. If you watched Man of Steel and BVS and then Justice League, there's a whole bunch of stuff that kind of doesn't make sense. Like the whole, they sort of set up in Batman versus Superman that this evil Superman future where Lois will die with the Flash coming forward. And it feels like they're trying to set up stuff that they're going to use in the sequel. And then they kind of just abandon all of that. So in a way, it sort of made the movie age not nearly as well as Civil War, which mostly feels like it fits very nicely within the Marvel thing, except I guess in Avengers, they seem to have sort of dropped any discussion of the Sokovia signing that thing, signing the Accords. Yeah, I'm assuming that basically when the next batch of aliens turned up in Infinity War, like the most powerful alien on the entire planet, they went, yeah, you know what, bureaucracy, paperwork, we can let that go. I do think though, I think you're 100% right that BVS has aged badly because DC abandon their plans. They clearly had an idea, as you said, they were setting up this film ambitiously to be unlike having the uh, long runway of eight years before uh, between Iron Man and Civil War. 
this film- <laughs> They're taking a shortcut. Yeah. <laughs> and so Dawn of Justice is meant to reflect Justice League coming together and they, through a series of quick time videos, quickly try and hint at this world of Cyborg and Aquaman and The Flash and so on. But the other issue, and this reflect comes back to circle back to our character of Lex Luthor, apparently- in the two films, not one film, but the two films, like Justice League Part 1 and Justice League Part 2, we were going to see that Darkseid was actually channeling himself through Lex Luthor, which was explaining some of his odd tics and distracted speeches. So there's actually a part in the film in BVS where Lex Luthor's talking, and he kind of like loses track of what he's talking about. Apparently, that was actually meant to hint at him being a voice of this incredibly powerful alien dark side. Is he the bad guy in the next No. Book? So, what happened was he's the uncle, I think, of that one. <laughs> right. And so, the, Justice League the, Part the, 1 was going to be the guy that we saw, whose name escapes me, in Justice League. And then we'd see the ultimate, ultimate baddie yeah. in the next film, Justice League Part 2. When my uncle gets here, man, he's going to fuck yeah. you up. And they basically then oh, combined that, that characters just- and just had one big bad. Horrific. Right. So, is it in the in the director's cut of Batman vs Superman? There's more stuff about Lex Luthor like communing with the villain from Justice League or something. Is a little a bit. Um, so, there's more detail with Lex Luthor. There's more with Jimmy Olsen. Where they set up, he actually says, "I'm Jimmy Olsen." There's just more scenes that kind of make the film sort of, I guess, move more smoothly. Like is there more uh, Granny's peach tea. No more urine in a glass. No. There are just more details that slightly justify a few choices that the characters make, which are just sort of skipped over in the two and a half hour version. So it definitely makes it a better film. I actually quite enjoyed Batman v Superman after watching the Ultimate Edition. So I can't recall every detail, but there are enough details in that half an hour to bring more of the film together. Now, it doesn't solve the problem about how ridiculous the plan is by Lex Luthor at all. It doesn't solve weird, crazy choices involving Lois Lane and how she's disempowered at the end by throwing a spear into the water randomly and then retrieving the spear. It doesn't solve the part where, you know, there's a bullet set up to try and place Superman who doesn't shoot bullets at the scene of a massacre in Africa. Hey, here's a dumb question, which have may not say. Do you think you could just edit Lex Luthor out of the movie? Like, is there enough setup talking before about Batman and Batman just being shitty at Superman for trashing a city and destroying Wayne Enterprises. Could you just lift Lex out of the movie? Oh, we should speak to Topher Grace, who did that one half hour cut combining the three prequels. Oh, well, he's single-handedly running like fanedit.org or something. Seems to be, yeah. Yeah. Like he doesn't actually put these online, but I would think if you did a fan edit, as you're describing, and took out Lex Luthor, it'd be interesting to see how it'd look. I'm sure someone's done it already. It'd be a very interesting film because- We both agree that the collateral damage caused by Superman at the start of this film, Batman v Superman, and throughout the ending of the third act of Man of Steel is enough motivation for Bruce Wayne by itself. So why not take out Lex Luthor, like you say, and see what you're left with? It removes the ridiculous machinations of him trying to pit one against the other, which is, I think, 50% of the There's no real ending, I suppose, though, because you need someone to let loose old cave troll. I guess you could say you'd basically make it they just appeared on Earth. Or just the movie ends after Batman and Superman fight and he's like, who's Martha? Oh, yeah. And it's just like, the end. No, no. And like, then, no oh, well. You have an after credit sequence where you introduce Lex <laughs> Luthor creating this oh, hybrid sure. and that's the next movie. Yeah, sure. There you go. Well, I guess they still got to go save, but Lex has kidnapped Diane Lane. Oh, take all that. So I, he's still trying to- I completely forgot all about that. Take that out. That's terrible. Right. So, anyway, we we'll probably need to look into this further or more scientifically. Maybe there's someone out there who knows the answer to this, but, yeah, it seems doable. If someone has or knows someone who has or has seen a fan edit without Lex Luthor, text us. We'd love to know. Or or one with more Lex Luthor, being an Eisenberg fan of his performance. So, ah. maybe if an edit with just Lex Luthor. It's like Lex Luthor, Dawn of Justice. Yeah, Bruce Wayne and Clark Kent just aren't in it at all. It's just... Lex Luthor. Nice. I like it. So basically, it's like the antagonist's point of view. And around the periphery, you have these two superheroes making this poor billionaire's life difficult, driving him to madness. Yes, <laughs> exactly. All right. Let's uh, jump to the box office. So which movie was the box office champ? Do you want to guess? Well, Captain America Civil yeah. War. So interestingly, both films were made on the same production budget of $250 million, which is a lot 
for both films, but surprises me with Batman v Superman because Captain America is going in with eight years of salaries to pay. I'm sure about $50 million is owed to Robert Downey Jr. for that. But I'm surprised Batman v Superman costs that much. I mean, they wouldn't have got Ben Affleck for a bargain, but they weren't going in with being tied over the table with pre-existing contracts. And the film doesn't look so amazing to me that all the money's on screen. So that's interesting. But the budget for each film was 250. Batman v Superman did 330 domestic and 543 million foreign for a total of 873 and a half million worldwide. It's not exactly. some change. And Captain America did 408 domestically. So not that much more domestically, only about $78,000 more. So $78 million more, plus $745 million for foreign for a worldwide total of $1.1 billion dollars. So interestingly, so that's a lot thing. more of the foreign Wouldn't market the- and totally paying off, you know, having built 10 to 15 films beforehand. And it's a sort of $1 billion thing, right, where the Warner Brothers executives would probably be disappointed they didn't crack the, the sweet billy. Yeah, 100%. I think they would have assumed having had just Batman in The Dark Knight, Dark Knight Rises do $1 billion, they would have probably thought right in the coattails of that particular Batman series. And throwing in Superman as well, it would surely- billion easy, right? It's yeah, just that's totally. good math. Totally, it's, totally. It's good math. So, yeah, not as great. Not as great. No, that's Fruit. right. Now, Fact. Now, Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, this gets great. This is good. Okay, Rotten Tomatoes. So, Rotten Tomatoes, Batman v Superman, 27% is a critical score and 63% audience score. And Captain America, 91% critical and 89% audience so, 89 versus 60-ish for the popular score by film fans. I mean, none of that surprises me. I'm surprised it's 60-ish, 63 for Batman v Superman, given how badly the critics just mauled it. But I think the fans are more forgiving. Yeah, although I guess with any of these sorts of movies, it's like, look, I guess with any comic book movie, you just don't want to get into any of this Rotten Tomatoes business. Just stay well away from that. Because before you know it, it's all that Disney's paying people DC fans are, and it just seems we should just leave all discussion of reviews and audience scores of Marvel and DC movies just at that. Totally. Hashtag release the Snyder Cut. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I would watch the shit out of that. (laughs) Okay, now we jump to the awards. And I present to you the first award, the Best Dialogue Award, which we still haven't named yet. We need to try and find a name for this. Any ideas? What film has the best or worst dialogue of all time? Because that could be the name of the dialogue award. Any ideas? Heist. Heist. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't know. It's just the one that Any met- We head. could actually call it the best dialogue Mamet Ward. Yeah. Although, isn't he a bit probo these days? Probably should leave that yeah. alone. Oh, that's true. No. We'll come back to it. As still as yet unknown. Okay. So, my favorite quote, I've got two. I think one is Martha. Just because, not favorite, but iconic. Oh, yeah. like, if someone said to you, name one quote that defines that film for better or worse, I'd say when Batman and Superman discover that their mums share the same name, Martha. It's the thing that everyone remembers from that movie. Yeah. Though, isn't yeah. It? How about you? I don't think either of these movies are quotable at all. So to be honest, it's not like other films we've done where it's like, oh, yeah, I remember this line and this line and wasn't it great and quotable. So I have to look it up. And even then when I went and read through, say, Captain America, Civil War, like, memorable quotes. None of them are like, oh, yeah, that shit was iconic. Yeah, there's none. I mean, Civil War, there was a quote where Captain America is talking about Bucky and he says to Tony Stark, he's my friend. And Iron Man says, so was I, with clenched jaw. Oh, like, yeah. there are fil- and, lines like that which that- work in a trailer, but they're, they're, they're like trailer lines. They're not lines I yeah, think back yeah. and remember. This is not to say that the movie isn't well written. I think it's a very well constructed screenplay. That you're always kind of agreeing with both points of view in a way, but it just doesn't. You don't walk away from it going, for the next 15 years, people are going to be on playgrounds. Like, if it bleeds, we can kill it. Totally. Like Predator. That's Predator. It is. There is one line which I think reflects many of the problems of the characterization of Superman in both Man of Steel and Batman v Superman. That's by Martha Kent, where she says, be their hero, Clark, be their angel, be their monument, be anything they need you to be, or be none of it. You know this world a damn thing. You never did. It's a bizarre line because it's meant to basically inspire him on one hand and then just says with the other, oh, actually, yeah, no, it's okay. But this it's sort like of- when someone says, la, 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 
Having said that, let me say this. <laughs> I don't give a shit. It's the opposite. Yeah. This all sort of feeds into it. And I guess there's been people who've talked way more at length about it and frankly really give much of a shit about the sort of like proto fascist, objectivist, and Randian, Zack Snyderian version of Superman, who is some sort of like Ubermensch Superman, who doesn't owe the Oh, humor's a goddamn thing. And I guess it feeds into that, right? And all of Park Kent stuff from the previous film. It even crops up in this in some capacity that I don't remember. Love Casey. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But yeah. it's all sorts of feeds into that. And again, it's, you do you could listen to whole podcasts about that sort of questionable choices they make with the character. Yeah. Well, ding ding ding, I'm giving it to Bizarrely, the best dialogue award winner is going to Batman is Superman. Just for Martha. Just for Martha. No, it's context. iconic. Yeah. All right. Let's jump to the winner, winner chicken dinner award. <laughs> Who came out on top in sure. each of these three movies? I kind of prefer that in the previous award we had no name for it, and then this one we're going for winner, winner chicken dinner. But let's keep uh, plucking that chicken. <laughs> so, who was it a career high for? Who did the best in this movie? Who sailed in Batman v Superman? First of all, who sailed? I don't know. Did anyone really sail in? I would say I Ben Affleck did. I mean, he was totally criticised when he was first cast. And now people talk about him being the best realisation of Batman on screen. Who says that? Everyone, the fanboys. No, do they? Yeah, they, they say that both the character and his performance is the best realisation of no, Batman. No, they don't. They say Val Kilmer's the best. <laughs> or George Clooney. Also, no, I mean, they don't say I'm that. not sure if Gail Godot demonstrated Oh, yeah, that's everything, true. But she definitely was also criticised. Yeah, yeah. And she's on screen for like five minutes in total. and. Everyone was gagging for her Wonder Woman film after this. Yeah, so a sick guitar riff. Oh yeah, her own, yeah song. So I'd say that she definitely did well. Now Civil War. Who do you think in Civil War, Sean? I think, like I said before, actually, I really liked the way they introduced um, young Spidey Man in this, and I thought, oh man, this kid's really good in this. So Tom Holland. Yeah. So who I wins, thought, Tom maybe- Holland or Gal Gadot? Is this the third way superhero beat up movie? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's Tom Holland versus Gal Gadot. I don't know. <laughs> you pick. <laughs> I think they both did really well. I would say I really like Gal Gadot, but I think in terms of realising the character who's meant to be a kid who we hadn't seen on screen, we'd seen like 40-year-old Tobey Maguire and like skater boy, emo character in The Amazing Spider-Man. I'd say that Tom Holland in the short role, in the short scenes that he had, totally captures that character as I understand it from the comics. So I'd give it to Tom Holland. I think both these movies do pretty good jobs of quickly jamming in characters who are going to later go on to their own standalone movies weirdly pretty well. Totally. I mean, you can criticise these films have both been too long, the two and a half hours, but they're trying to share the scenes amongst a lot of characters and introducing a new character I mean, it's even harder for Civil War because they're actually introducing the third incarnation of Spider-Man on screen in about 15 years. That's a bigger challenge, I think, than introducing the first incarnation of Wonder Woman. So, Yeah, and they've got to set up Black Panther in the same movie. Yeah, totally. Hey, this is yeah. his origin film also. In fact, I might actually change my winner here. I might say Chadwick Boseman does quite well because he obviously was impressive enough for the audience that it, besides that led to his subsequent film, which was already in the pipeline. But actually, he must have had enough presence to drive that film to over $1 billion for an unknown character for most people. So I'm giving it to- All right. Yeah, give it to the Okay, the done. All right. Next up, ding, ding, ding. Black Panther was The cool. Tommy Lee Jones' Steel Award, named after the iconic performance by Tommy Lee Jones in a supporting role in The Fugitive, where he blew Harrison Ford off the screen and was rewarded with an Oscar for his efforts. So- who sold the show against all odds in these twin movies because their role was so small, their role was underwritten, but they somehow rose above it? Gal Gadot, Chadwick Bosman, or Tom Holland? Frank Grillo. Oh, yes, Frank Grillo. But I guess he doesn't really steal it, no. does he? I just like it when Frank Grillo turns up in movies. Just like, I know that, I recognise that guy from MMA. Yeah, yeah. Frank Grillo is great, though. I mean, it's a shame that he's actually covered in a mask at the starting sequence of... Civil War, which is the catalyst for the Sokovia uh, Accords, where he fire he sets off a like a suicide grenade, basically, doesn't he? And that leads to the explosion. Yeah, and then he gets like blasted. The, what's the name? Scarlet Witch like fires him into the air, and that's where they accidentally kill the yeah. Innocent okay, people. so you're, you're giving it to Frank Grillo. 
No, I guess the thing that everyone kind of likes and remembers from Civil War is the big superhero bash him up sequence. Uh, I'm going to go Ant-Man? with that. Okay. When it becomes big. Oh, that nice. was neat. Okay. Big Ant Man. Okay. Yeah. Just fun stuff. All right. Next, the Ding Ding Ding, the Edward Furlong Award. Okay. What about the Joseph Fines Award? The Joseph Fines Award. Oh. Wait, do we have to call okay. it Edward Furlong? Can we so, call for context Joseph for Fiennes? listeners, the Edward Furlong Award, and now possibly known as the Joseph Fines Award, is named after an actor who had a lot of opportunities after a successful film. In the case of Edward Furlong, it was T2, Terminator 2. In the case of Joseph Fiennes, it was Shakespeare in Love. All right, let's call it the Joseph Fiennes Award because Joseph Fiennes never really For this week, and then next week we'll be main to somebody else. So did this film ruin the career of anyone or did someone in this film not make the most of their opportunity after this film? So starting with BVS. Starting with BVS, sure, but we could pretty much rule out anyone's career being ruined by being in Captain America Civil War, right? Yeah. I don't like, I, I like, think anyone suffered badly. Yeah. Zero. So I reckon the winner's going to be BVS. I would say Zack Snyder. I'd say the critical mauling this film took Ooh. dramatically affected his subsequent film, Justice League. There was, sadly, the complication of a personal tragedy in his family, which was the reason or a contributing reason why he stepped off Justice League and who's our mate from the Avengers? Josh Whedon came in. Josh Whedon. But I would say that Snyder's power would have been pretty significantly diluted after the disaster that many people perceived was BVS. Totally. There'd be a lot of internal discussions, right, about have we had the right guy? Because he was meant to be the architect for this entire DC universe and that all fell apart. Like they have course corrected crazily. And when everyone's talking about Gal Gadot being a, a character of hope and then that film, her Wonder Woman film, just soaring at the box office, and then looking at the success of the goofy, chipper Aquaman, I'd say that the executives at Warner Brothers are probably pretty thankful for their pivot away from the Snyder Dark World. If they make another Justice League, there will definitely be an octopus playing the drums in it. Yeah, there'll be two. 16 tentacles? <laughs> All right. The Bill Fleck Gilly Award, named after American indie actors Billy Bob Thornton and Ben Affleck, who seized the opportunity to jump from the indie films, Sling Blade and Goodwill Hunting, to launch a Hollywood career with Armageddon. So, Gabe, who jumped into the big league with either BVS or Civil War? I guess there's a bunch of people who are sort of holdovers from the previous movies in these series because you couldn't say, oh, it was cool seeing Jeremy Irons as Alfred. Oh, no, this is the first time he was Alfred. He wasn't in Man of Steel, was he? Oh, I liked him. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. go with... Jeremy Irons slumming it in a giant superhero movie. Well, he didn't actually jump into the big league. I mean, Jeremy Irons is a legend. So I wouldn't no, say that's that not like, was he ever star in star rose. He was never in one of these types of movies before, was he? No, that's I true. Mean, been- I mean, I'd say Gal Gadot's star rose, but she had been in Fast Five and I think Fast Six. So she was familiar with Tent Pole. She's not indie. No, that's true. You're right. She wasn't indie. You're right. Yeah. Okay, Jeremy Irons. Scoot McNary turns up in Batman. Oh, yeah, you're right. Scoot Scoot McNary. McNary. Yeah, you're right. Scoot McNary. He should have held out for a better role in a different one rather than just (laughs) Lieutenant Dan's new legs. (laughs) 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 Yeah, I think I agree with Scoot. Anyone from Civil War? I mean, you could say Daniel Brühl. Oh, yeah. He's great. I love him. So- who do we hand it to? Daniel Brühl versus <laughs> Scoot, Scoot McNary. McNary's new legs. Just hilarious. I'm giving it to Daniel Brühl. I mean, he basically was – he had had one big film with Inglorious Bastards, but a lot of European films and smaller roles. I'd say that his role on screen as the main antagonist is a bigger deal than Scoot McNary's smaller side character. So I'm handing it to Daniel Brühl. How about okay, you? Fair. Also, he's really great in that Ron Howard movie, Rush, where he plays Nicky Lauder. Just throwing it in there. Ah, I must see. All right, it's on my uh, Netflix queue. Okay. The Stephen Toblowski Award, a.k.a. Hey, it's that guy award, named after the iconic supporting actor Stephen Toblowski, who has appeared in over 260 films and TV shows. Many know him as the insurance salesman Ned Ryson from Groundhog Day. So, Gabe, which actor triggered, hey, it's that guy, when he or she appeared on screen, starting with BVS? Michael Shannon's weird body cast version of himself as Zod. Hey, it's that guy. <laughs> so do you think he actually was a body cast or he actually was paid to play a corpse? 
No, they probably just paid him to be in it, but he never actually was in it. Right, okay. Like they paid uh, Michael Bain to be, fuck you, pay me to use my, like, you're going to kill me off off screen while you put me in the movie as a picture. You can pay me now. (laughs) Alien 3, you know. I'd give it to Holly Hunter or Lauren Cohen from The Walking Dead who plays Martha Wayne. See, I watched it. I didn't even realise she was – I must have blinked in the bit where they rehash Batman's parents getting shot again. It's a pretty short role. If I never have to see that scene in another fucking movie, I'll be – I'm fine with that. Okay, then how about – I guess for some people it would be Daniel Brühl's in Civil War. So returning to possibly accept another – John Slattery? Oh, yeah, John Slattery. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, so who's going to win, John Slattery or – No, Hope Davis. Hope Davis. Yes, Hope Davis, indie actor from the late 90s, fantastic lead actress in Arlington Road, one of our favourite conspiracy films. Never referenced, by the way, when they talked about Winter Soldier. (laughs) No. But she's great. You're right. She uh, plays Tony Stark's mum in a virtual reality-esque flashback that appears at the start of the film. Yeah, I'd say Hope Davis is good. And for BVS? Didn't we say? Who did we say? We Holy said Hunter? Hunter. Okay. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, Kevin Gossner turns up in it. <laughs> it's like, I know that guy. That's Waterworld. <laughs> I'm not going to give it to Hope Davis. Okay, fair enough. All right. The Memphis Reigns Award, named after the absurdly named character played by Nick Cage from Gone in 60 Seconds. Gabe, which character steals the cake for the most ludicrous name? I was going to say Baron Nemo, but it turns out he's not even Baron Nemo. He's just Nemo. We should check this offline. Um, I've already checked it. I'll give you two uh, contenders if you like. Okay, go. B versus S is Mercy Graves, the Asian-American 2IC to Lex Luthor. Uh, who's, you've got to imagine had more scenes that got cut. That character's inexplicably w- sort of in it as it's just a kind of goon who tells him the toilet's upstairs and then she's just blown up. Yeah, totally. Apparently, she's actually a pretty iconic character in the comics. So, either they took the name and I guess didn't give the respect to the character in the comics or she had more scenes and they cut them out. I can't recall watching the ultimate cut that she appeared much more on screen. So, I don't think she did. And Civil War, Brock Ramlow, a.k.a. Crossbones. Oh, shit. Frank Grillo. His name is Brock? Yep, Brock. Brock Rumlow? Ramlow. Yeah, or R O M. L O A W. Brock Rumlow. It's got to be okay. Brock, doesn't it? Frank. Yeah, Roy, anyway, that's, that's, a, that's a terrible name. All right. So Brock wins. Okay. The Die Hard and Building Award, named after the influence of Die Hard in inspiring a sub genre of an everyday hero who's up against a group of baddies in a single location. So if imitation is the ultimate form of flattery, did either of these films leave a legacy by inspiring a crop of clones? What do you think? Well, I suppose based on what we've talked about with Marvel films and them all having a similar feeling, then this is just one of many same but different clones off a kind of conveyor belt of top quality Marvel product. Yeah, totally. I mean, I'd say that Marvel films have always had pretty uninteresting baddies and Daniel Brühl's is good, but he's not a great villain. So in many respects, this film is just a clone of a clone of a clone from the Marvel cookie cutout factory. I would say it has to win because Warner Brothers did such a hard pivot with their DC universe after this film that they didn't want to try and imitate this film or clone it in any way. And they tried to distance themselves and reshoot Justice League as much as possible. So I'd say the winner there goes to Marvel sort of Fair. as a bit of a shrug, like not an inspiring choice. All right. Which leads me to shrug and move on to the next yeah, one. Huh? Which leads me to the Milking the Speed Cow Dry Award, which always sounds a bit kind of yeah, no, yucky. That's, that's named yes, after the infamous sequel Speed 2, which took the high stakes of a runaway bus in a crowded city and relocated it to a sluggish cruise ship. So could you make a sequel to either of these films if a gun was pressed against your forehead and you had to? Well, they tried. <laughs> that's right. Hey, look, they made sequels. I should, just on this question, title, sounds like it could be more something from like Freddy Got Fingered or something. Milking a speed cat. Yeah, I know. I know. Like, sound a bit dirty. In 2000s, Farrelly Brothers reference. What are you doing? I'm milking the speed cow. Do you have any alternative titles for this award? For this award? No, milking the speed cow is great. Now every time I think about it, I'm thinking about like Tom Green jerking off a cow while flying down the highway. Okay, and the last award is the Memento Award. Name for moments you completely forgot about until you rewatch the movie in preparation for this podcast. 
Oh, I found Batman vs Superman: Dawn of Justice full of these. Actually, that's one of the reasons I quite enjoyed it. I was like, check out this Granny's Peach T-shirt. This is fucking <laughs> wild. Like, it actually had quite a like. I sort of forgot Scoot McNary was in it with no legs. Batman branding people. I was like, well, that's weirdly violent. Yeah. That I forgot it actually had a whole bunch. What about you? I agree. The branding part I recall, but I'm not sure if it was the Ultimate Edition or also in the regular one, but it just seemed harsher. And I remember that being criticism of the character that he was branding people and killing people. And Zack Snyder said in interviews that that's the version of Batman he likes in the real world. You know, like, of course, he'd have to kill people. And when he brands them, he didn't actually kill them, but he basically makes them dead man walking so that they're killed by someone else later in prison. So, look, it, it felt more violent than I recalled, actually. That was the biggest thing I recall. It just seemed darker than I remember, which is funny to say because the film was criticised for trying to be too dark and too serious and too grounded. But I was surprised, and maybe it's because of the marvelification of superhero films and also having recently watched uh, Wonder Woman and Aquaman, I'd forgotten how dark this film was in comparison. I mean, this isn't a serial killer film. It's not a Michael Mann serious exploration of criminal enterprise, but it is aesthetically dark and has a lot of kind of pretty disturbing imagery for a PG-13 in the US or M in Australia film. Totally. Not enough of that Michael Mann duality. So the last thing was just to dream up a third movie, taking the best of both elements. If there's a third movie combining both these films, Gabe, pitch me what film would that be? i got to say, with these sorts of superhero movies, you just a little bit of you just sort of feels like you just whacking together. The word's not dolls. What do you call figurines? Yeah, figurines. Yeah. Action figures. Full disclosure, the only action figure I have is a Jean Renault from the professional action figure. So I'm not, I'm not up with the, with the lingos, with the collectible I've lingos. got a present from someone. It's a Breaking Bad. What are those ones which have the big heads? Bobblehead. No, a pop vinyl. Basically, it's those ones that have those giant heads that are kind of decorative and intended to be used left in a box or sit on a bookshelf. Don't you own a bunch of the monkey shines, like symbol banging monkeys? Oh, you're right. I own three of those. So, to any fans of Toy Story 3, it's Toy Story 3, isn't it? Oh, I thought that was from that George A. Romero movie, Monkey Shines. You know, with the guy with the capuchin monkey, it's his helper monkey, but it's like- I've never seen it. I think it's Toy Story 3 that there's actually the classic wow. 60s monkey that has the red and white striped pants, the yellow vest, and this kind of devilish grin. And he has these symbols, and in the, I think it's Toy Story 3, he's a, like, kind of like alarm guy watching yeah. these CCTV okay. cameras. And then when he sees something, he, like, bangs his oh. symbols together. Well, there you go. I always thought I was from, three of I those. I just thought you were a giant George A. Romero fan, so that's disappointing. Anyway, <laughs> this is the point, I guess, was wouldn't you just throw Batman and Superman into the same bloody back alley brawl that they have in Avengers and, oh, gosh darn it. Let's see if Spider-Man can take on Superman. Because I'm not much less creative with this one than other ones we've talked about. It's like, ah, eh, there's superhero movies. Just have them punch each other some more. Yeah, exactly. I think we kind of pitched an earlier version, which was the better version of B versus S. I don't know what else I take really from Civil War and inject into that film. I mean, I guess I like the idea where Bucky Barnes, aka the Winter Soldier, the guy with the metal arm, it turns out he's the maturing candidate-esque assassin who kills Tony's parents. That's a good form of motivation, I suppose. But it's not really directly pitting him against Captain America. I mean, Captain America defends his mate Bucky, but I'm not sure that's enough to pit him directly. And this is the problem with both these films, is that when I see them fighting, I don't feel the stakes. I mean, at least in Batman v Superman, Batman actually does want to kill Superman. I feel that he actually is trying to kill him, and I feel Superman's holding his punches for the first part, and then basically when he realises this guy won't stop and is a danger to the city as he perceives it, he probably is trying to kill him. He kind of says, stay down, stay down, and Batman doesn't stay down. A bit like how Tony Stark says to Captain America, stay down, stay down, and Captain America says- But isn't there all kind of irony then that- you pit Batman and Superman against a kind of CG monster and you're like, I don't really care. This is all sort of fake and phony and there's no real stakes here. But then you also pit characters that you ostensibly do care about, Iron Man versus Captain America, and you're like, I don't really care. There's no stakes here. It's not like 
Captain America is actually going to punch a hole through Iron Man's head or Iron Man's actually going to use his lasers to blast a hole through Captain America. So, like, all of these movies, you're always kind of like, it's just too much money at stake for them to ever actually, especially in a Captain America Part 3 where ostensibly Iron Man is the guestie. They're not going to kill off Iron Man in that movie. Yeah, and we know this because we've seen what's happened with Loki who was originally just a side antagonist in the first Thor film and then basically was so popular and was essentially the best villain they had. He's been killed off like three times and up until recently, and spoiler for Endgame, it appears he's- Oh, no, he's actually not dead, is he? No, he's no, no that's just that multiverse shit. That doesn't even make- They've muddled it all up with that time-travelling business. Yeah, but they're actually doing a Disney Plus streaming TV show yeah, but with that, him oh, okay. in it. I read somewhere that that was maybe set So in basically- the past. I don't know. Oh, it doesn't matter though, right? Because well, there's any number of Loki's existing in any number of multiverses now. Yeah. So it, what this we're at though is the stakes are that basically no one is ever dead, which, to be fair, is pretty much the entire business model of all comics. I mean, haven't they killed off Superman before? No, that's right. Maybe the actors playing them might die, and different incarnation appears instead. There's been like three, five Spider Mans. I mean, I've totally forgotten that Andrew Garfield was a Spider Man until you brought him up earlier. Like, holy shit. Was that a fever dream that everyone sort of just, huh? <laughs> totally. It's like what? dog years, isn't it? It's like somehow they made not just one but two films. Like they had Paul Giamatti playing oh, yeah. the character yeah. Rhino. That's, like, that's Seriously. <laughs> like there's actually like a goblin character in I think the second yeah, Spider-Man, yeah, the amazing yeah. Spider-Man. Yeah. Oh. Like I mean, when we first saw the goblin character who did actually resemble an action figure, resembled a figurine, played by Willem Dafoe, in that first Spider-Man, that was kind of criticised as being a bit goofy. But compared to that weird one that I saw played by our mate Dane, oh, my God, like, Defoe's character looked ten times better. Yeah. And it's interesting because, like, everyone, people ragged on Batman versus Superman, but surely compared to those Spidey-Man movies, it's pretty good. Pretty, pretty, <laughs> pretty good. Yeah, exactly. All right, mate, let's uh, wrap this one up. That brings us to the end of the show. Gabe, where can listeners find more of your work and musings this week? Find me on Twitter, at Gabe Dowrick. It's just nothing but hashtag release the Snyder Cut from me. <laughs> and I'm at Ben Phelps on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube.com slash Ben Phelps. And you can catch my other podcasts, including Twin Movies and What Happens Next, curated within one mega podcast called The Ben Phelps Show in the usual places like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. All right, thanks for listening, folks. Thank you, Gabe. That's been fun. It's been fun. Stay tuned for another Twin Movies battle coming very soon. Adios. Adios.